Welcome everyone back for another episode of the Supercoach Hub podcast for NBL Supercoach. Uh, I'm Chad, Fantasy Phoenix. I'm here with the main man, Boz. How are we doing, mate? Yeah, very good, Phoenix. Uh, very, very excited. Um, what, three days away now until the opening uh, round of the season. And look, to be honest, I haven't selected my side in full just yet. I've got two teams that I have up that I look at every single night and I'm stressing um, but I know that, you know, by Thursday night, there'll be something locked in and hopefully it'll be um, good enough for, for round one. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, in a similar boat. There's uh, I, I have got a little bit of toying with a, with a cotton build, but now I'm in a similar place where there's two two avenues to go. And I'm sure that I'll probably go the opposite. Whichever one I pick will be the one that tanks. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes when the season kicks off. But uh Yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely getting exciting. We're very, very close now, only a couple of days to go. So looking forward to it. No, no doubt. It's, uh, it's a good time of year for me. AFL finishes and then NBL starts. So, yeah, can't complain. Oh, it's perfect this year. There's sometimes those awkward years where there's a couple of weeks in between where there's nothing. But this year, it's been seamless. So it's fantastic stuff. All right, so uh, everyone, if you want to make sure, if you're enjoying the content, obviously, please make sure to like and subscribe the video. And importantly, we've got a Discord too, so that'll be linked in the description below. Make sure to join up. There's obviously plenty of access with all of us. We're always in there talking, giving advice, and there's also ways you can join up to some leagues as well. So there is one league for an overall competition that if uh, the winner will win a $250 voucher as well as one of those awesome super coach rings. Uh, talk to Vern's about that. He was the winner of it uh, last year. And then there's also the charity fundraiser as well. So that league is $25 entry. 50% of it goes to the charity and the other 50% is all going towards the prize pool. So make sure to check those out and jump in as well. Right. So Excellent. we can uh, we can dive straight in. So obviously a couple of days ago, the Blitz wrapped up. So that is... Uh, Good. We got a little bit of uh, some indication of what's going on. Was there anything that stood out to you, Boz, about uh, any of the roles or any of the players throughout the Blitz? Look, there was there was plenty at the Blitz. I mean, uh, you know, for, from teams that last time we spoke on the podcast, like Adelaide, that kind of looked like we knew how they were going to run that that four position. But then, you know, the signing of Montrez Harrell kind of throws a spanner in the works there. And mm-hmm. um you know, teams like Tasmania are only really playing one game and then, and then heading off to um, the international club championship. So, look, there was a lot of kind of finding outs about teams that we might not really want to target early, but I think there was a lot of positives. So, a team like Brisbane, they pretty much rolled out their expected lineups, their expected minutes, game in, game out. So, I know the Brisbane schedule isn't ideal, but in terms of seeing role, seeing kind of minutes, seeing rotations, I think it was really good to see. Um, you know, kind of players like a Prather or a Zakarski, who most of us may have on their, our benches. Uh, it was just nice to see they were getting consistent minutes and putting up consistent numbers for that for that cash generation. Oh, definitely. So Brisbane was one of the teams that I was watching just with a lot of frustration that their schedule wasn't just, even if it was slightly better, just throw in a double or two before round nine. <laughs> There's a, a lot of hot prospects, that's for sure. And uh, obviously, uh, Burns is very keen on one of them. But um, yeah, Brisbane, It's there's all every year there's always a team that you really want people from it, but the schedule just doesn't allow. So uh, for anyone that's new tuning in and you're not familiar with the NBL side of Supercoach, it's similar to BBL where s- the schedule is really, really important. It's not the same as the AFL where you can pick your primos and your rookies and you kind of just sitting them for a long time. The fact that we don't have limited trades, well, we have limited boosts, but you get two trades plus every week plus four boosts, is it's a very rotational uh, setup for the competition. So for those that aren't familiar, you've got your five starters on on the court and five bench guys, but the other difference is your bench scores 50%. So any new listeners, make sure to keep that in mind and hopefully we'll be able to help you pick a solid team. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the important thing is, uh, differing from if you were playing, you know, an NRL or an, an AFL super coach, I, I tend to play those platforms a bit safer. Um, I think NBL, you can really take a bit of a punt or really take a bit of a, a gamble on someone who you think, you know, might pay off because if they do, uh, or if they don't, sorry, you, you have the trades every week set up to be able to get that player out or, you know, you have those trades there available to cover something if it does go wrong. So don't stress too much about, you know, a player, 
um, that you think might do well kind of come out, let's say, for example, in round one and, and put up a, a five or a 10, whatever it might be, because um, you just get them out straight away. There's no real kind of negative to, to holding on to trades. Yeah, that's a great call there. It's uh, something that, especially if you're new to NBL Supercoach this year, you didn't play the format last year. Yeah, definitely something to keep in mind. That's a, that's a very good piece of advice there. If you take one thing from the podcast so far, I'd say that's it. <laughs> Now that's it. All right. So for for the blitz that just happened, uh, as a bit of a recap, so uh, Brisbane won. They, uh, as Boz was saying, they throughout all the preseason, so they had some other preseason games as well as the blitz, as did some other teams. They pretty much put the put the foot down. They wanted to kind of build momentum, I guess, after a bit of a rocky season last year, and they didn't really hold back. There was a couple of sit outs uh, throughout, but nothing too major. So. Tyrell Harrison, big, big play for them. Rocco points per minute was pretty good as well. The the import trio, especially one being so cheap in Casey Prather, was uh, one to really look at. The Some other teams, uh, as Boz mentioned, so Tasmania only played the two blitz games due to the fact that they had to go over to the cup. But um, they, they did all right over there. They've played their third game. I haven't actually got the stats from game three. I haven't put that in yet. But... The first two games was a lot different to the Blitz for most of the players. So I know a lot of people were a bit sheepish on uh, Will Magne from his performances in the preseason at the Blitz, but uh, his performance over there has been the Will Magne that we uh, know and love, I guess. So 40 super coach points in their first game and 27 in their second. Hit the scoreboard. I think between the two games, he had 12 or double-figure blocks across the two excuse me, across the two games. So that's definitely one to look at. Is there anyone, Tasmania do have a sort of early double. Is there anyone you'd be looking at from from the Jackies? Well, I think Magne was my guy. I mentioned it last week on the podcast that I was a bit scared. Uh, but I think looking into it now, you can probably see that Scott Roth may have just been kind of easing their minutes in the blitz just to make sure they were playing a full or a fuller load of minutes come um, that cup. So, yeah. Oh, you know, like Magna is just firmly back on my radar now. Um, but in terms of that double in round three that they have, you know, there's nothing wrong with going a Milton Doyle. There's nothing wrong with a, a Jordan Crawford. These are two guys that have scored well in the past. And I think mm-hmm. with the 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 loss of Jack McVeigh heading over to the Houston Rockets on a two-way, uh, they need more scoring. And I know Doyle was at times last year, uh, let's say, kind of ridiculed for his kind of passive play. He kind of was happy to sit yes. in the corner, happy just to – let other guys do the work. I think he will have to kind of increase his offensive load for the Jackies if they are thinking of going back to back. So someone like a Milton Doyle could be a guard that you could target in round three if you wanted to go down that route. Yeah, I think that's a that's a fair call. I mean, uh, obviously Dave was a big fan. Jordan Crawford was a huge reason for his uh, success winning it all last year. He uh, got him early and held through. Um, yeah, you, the McVay call is obviously very, very big. It's he put up decent numbers throughout, not necessarily super coach for a lot of games, but just decent stat numbers throughout the year. And Craig Sword, who they brought in as that third import uh, from what we've seen and including the games that they just played over at the Cup, he's not going to be that guy. Lower minutes, not really great production on the stat sheet. Gorjak Gak didn't play in the Cup over there either, so he didn't quite get that read as the big man backup, well, sort of backup five that he probably could be in the league. It's uh, it's an interesting one, the JJs. They're kind of like that team that great basketball team, as you saw, they won the chip last year, but does that translate to super coach? And that's the question that you want to know. Funnily enough, last year, teams like Adelaide who finished second, third, last, they're the team you wanted to target because we're in a great basketball side, but geez, they had three or four guys that could just put up stat lines that, you know, really helped you in the super coach format. Oh, for sure. It's, uh, it's I guess, similar to uh, for people familiar with some of the other codes. You know, you might look at, say, AFL, for example, some North Melbourne players. They're not in the, the best team, but they're going to rack up the points for you. So, yeah, the JJs being very well-rounded is uh, a potential issue, as is uh, the team just above them, the Kings. Now, looking through the Blitz, it was a big shame that Adams didn't play at all. Uh, and Tui obviously missed as well. They, we haven't seen their full squad in action yet. When they played that preseason game, Jalen Galloway was on the roster, but he didn't suit up. So we still haven't seen the full full depth of the squad. 
Cooks is uh, someone that I have still seen a lot of people going for with his credentials in the league in previous seasons. But, yeah, I'd be wary. I know you guys spoke a lot about Cam Oliver last week. Is there anyone else from the Kings that caught your eye over the Blitz or leading into round one that might be worth a look with their good first couple of weeks schedule? I feel like it was Tui. So I think Tui really yeah. exploded at the Blitz. I, I know that Adams, uh, someone who loves having the ball in his hands was out the entire time, which was frustrating. But I think we saw that Brian Gordon's probably going to trust Tui to be a starting three, starting four. Uh, it seems like he has the minutes over Galloway at the moment. It seems like they're happy to kind of run Cooks 20, 25 minutes a night. They don't really need him to be that player playing 30, 35, just because of how yeah. stacked they are. So someone like Tui coming in at that 191K uh, could be a really handy, sneaky bench pod that potentially is in one of my teams that I'm trying to decide between. But again, is the 30-point games from Tui because Adams is out, Cooks is only playing 19 minutes, Space Cam's coming off the bench and being limited to about 25. These are the questions that just still weren't answered over the Blitz. So Sydney's, it's murky territory there. You know, as I said before, you can risk it. you got these two trades every week. Tui, if you like him, if you like what you've seen from him, go for it. But... If it backfires, well, then you just trade him out. But again, you know, as super coaches, we like to try and be perfect and try and hit every kind of selection. <laughs> so, um, you know, I guess it's up to you as who you are as a super coach player. But for me at the moment, Tui is someone I'd potentially take a gamble on. And I, and I will be in one of my teams if I do choose that team by Thursday. Yeah, I agree with you there. Of my my more likely lineup, I'm going to go with he's locked in on the bench for me there, along with um, someone that we'll talk about a bit later on. But yeah, I, it was pretty disappointing watching the Kings games in the fact that there's good cash cows there, but it's hard to know without the full lineup. So Tyler Roberts is someone that when he was signed, I was actually really high on. His offensive game throughout college career was incredible. Knocks down the shot, knows how to facilitate. The, the only thing is he's not the best offensive player. So I thought he, Gorgian's either going to make him a really good one or he's not going to want to play him too much. But his good scores obviously came when he was essentially him and Sean Bruce running the point rather than no Jalen Adams. So that one was a bit tough. With Tui, yeah, I definitely agree with what you're saying. It's hard because a lot of his points did come from actual points. Like he was scoring quite heavily. And is that something that is sustainable in that team throughout the year? I'm sure he's going to have some big games where he'll be the top scorer, maybe even of the round. But I don't know if he can hit that. Yeah, so he averaged uh, 29.3, so just a tick under 30 throughout all his preseason games. I don't know if we can expect that for the year moving forward. Yeah, no, I agree. 29 is probably a bit too high, but I think he's priced at, what, 16 maybe? Or is that too high maybe? Uh, be around, yeah, yeah wouldn't it be, be, yeah, it'd be around that. So, I mean, if you're getting 24, 25 as opposed to 29 from Tui, that's still going to be great cash generation, but also with these early Sydney doubles, could be someone that you sneak onto your court or it's a, it's a double that you're getting on your bench as well. So, very interesting option is Alex Tui. Definitely so. Yeah, I like you. I think he's someone that I've uh, I've got locked in. We can talk about uh, the big space cam Oliver who. Uh, who he he burnt me in the old format in a different way. I, I went a safe captain in the year that him and Machado were playing together. I went Machado instead of Oliver. If I had gone Oliver, I would have finished sixth, but I went Machado and I finished 11th. So I'm, I'm still angry that Space Cam played so well in that week where he wasn't meant to, but <laughs> he has been fantastic. They don't really have that other really big presence that, you know, I mean, Luape, yes, but not a, not a seasoned vet. He's, Plays a different game to Cooks. His shot's looking good as well. He has been locked into my team for quite some time, and I think he probably should be for a lot of people. Yeah, he's, he's firmly in mind, is Space Cam. And I think we saw at the Blitz, and I know there was a DVG was questioning, you know, uh, last week, he's played the most amount of minutes for Sydney off the bench. Is that a good thing, or is that actually a bad thing that he's getting that run now? But I think we saw that in the games that he was off the bench, and then also in their last Blitz game where they rested a few blokes, he actually started. In all those games, he was getting the minutes. So it doesn't really matter if he's coming off the bench or starting. It seems to me that Space Cam will always get that 22 to 25 minutes, and that is more than enough for him to produce. He is a stat filler. Definitely so. He is – Let me. yeah, so for his whole preseason, he went at 1.62 points per minute, which is insane. 
Like if you're getting that from anybody, that is beyond incredible. So it, yeah, very, very, very much fine. I, um, I, I'm a, I'm an Illawarra boy, so I'm a Hawks fan. And I was actually chatting to Brian Conklin a few years ago when talking to him about how he was coming off the bench. And basically he said, I don't care if I'm coming off the bench, but I want to be there on at the end of the game. And I want to be, if I'm getting the minutes, it doesn't matter if I start or not. So it, hopefully that's the, probably the attitude that Cam Oliver's got. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of games that he starts too. There's going to be some crunch time games where Gorge needs to have his uh, his main guys there for the long haul. And yeah, that'll definitely come for Space Cam. With with Jalen Adams missing, obviously we only got to see him in that preseason game where I think he only played about 15 minutes or so, scored a 18 or 19 from memory. Is he someone that uh, people could still look to start with their good schedule instead of, say, someone like a Bryce Cotton or something like that? Look, unless you're a Jalen Jalen Adams fanboy, fan woman, um, like unless you're obsessed with him and you, you're you're playing the game for fun, I totally understand that. Play it for fun, get your best <laughs> and favorite players on the court. But I just can't trust it at the moment. It's definitely a wait and see. And look, Sydney have a double in round two, so it's not to say that you just you know see how Jalen Adams goes in round one. He plays, he plays really well on the eye test. The ankle, I think, it is looks good. Okay, well, guess what? I started with Cotton. I have to downgrade, and my downgrade is now going to be to Jalen Adams. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, yeah. um, but at the same time, I'd be very hesitant to start someone at that price um, with the injury history coming into the season, especially in ankle, because we know with basketball, ankles are probably the most common injury. Yes, uh, that's been the curse of my playing days is uh, is ankles, but <laughs> so I, I know the pain. But uh, yeah, I, I agree with you there. He before obviously we saw the blitz. My initial strategy looking going in when the game opened was a one was a cotton build and just going straight to Jalen Adams in week two. But based off what we've seen bit underdone, as you're saying, I don't think starting with him, unless again, you're a big Kings fan or a big Adams fan. Yeah. Is, uh, is the right play. He's the expensive side of the piece for Sydney, but um, someone that's a little bit cheaper, Xavier cooks, who's also quite expensive. I don't think I saw from him. I, I know he's kind of like some of the AFL players and NRL players mentioned the preseason that don't really, the good, the stars don't really care too much. But yeah, I don't think I saw what you probably want to see from Cooks, especially with how stacked that team is and how they're going to roll. I initially had him in my squad before the Blitz, but now I've definitely cooled off a lot. What do you think about people going with Xavier Cooks? Yeah, look, you know, you look at it now and he's still got a 32% ownership. And I think, you know, mm. new players to the game or someone that may have started their team when it first opened and hasn't kind of looked at it yet, you're picking him on name value. So, that you know, he's been around the Boomers, he's played some NBA. Um, so I can kind of see why the ownership's high, but you're right. If you were someone that was a keen watcher of the Blitz in the preseason, you'd, you'd probably be backtracking a little bit. Now, not to say he doesn't just come out just like, you know, in the AFL, an example would be like a Bontem Pally. Does pretty well mm. in the in the preseason. Doesn't do, you know, just does what he has to do and then comes out round one and, you know, has 35 touches and three goals. So there's <laughs> there's no saying that Cooks doesn't come out here and just have a double-double from the get-go with a couple blocks and he scores a, you know, 35-40 to start the season. Yeah. But again, as a long-time Supercoach player, I like to see that from someone first before I trust it. Because as you said, we get burnt enough. In this for in, in all formats of super coach. So um yeah. look, haven't seen it, can't trust it. But again, if you like Cooks, if you like Sydney, sure, why not? Yeah, that's probably the fair play to do it. He's he's someone that he might burn you for a week, but if we get to see them when things get serious and he's still getting if he's gonna get numbers similar to what he has in his previous years in the league, then he's definitely someone to watch out for. On the on the other side, I mentioned Tyler Robertson before. He was a, a bench stash for me, but I've had to since change that. What about uh, I'm going to mispronounce his name, but Kelly Luape, Luape, Lu, Lupepe. I'm 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 butchering his name, and I I am sorry. Um, he's he started nearly uh, all games or all but one of the games at the five. What do we think? Sixty nine thousand put up some kind of all right numbers, but he's getting the minutes. The roles there, the scores weren't too much. What do you think about that for a bench stash? Yeah, look, for for, for me personally, it's really between him and Henshaw. So I know we'll probably touch on Henshaw yeah. in a moment, but I'm just trying to work out which one has the better scoring potential. I think 
Henschel has the better scoring potential, but I actually think, and I'm like you, Phoenix, I, I can't pronounce his name at the moment, and I'll, I'll wait for the commentators <laughs> to do that correctly. But um, Le Pepe. You call him Kelly or something. Yeah, Kelly. I, I think he will actually be the one with more of a safer role. Okay, it looks like Gorgian trusts him, looks like Gorgian likes him. Um, he's built um, like an absolute fridge. He's got a great kind of size about him, something you don't really see in a basketball player. So, you know, he must be doing something right to, to hold down that five spot. Now, he's a little bit undersized, but from what I've heard, uh, I do have a friend that has played basketball with him um, at a junior level. Um, he can okay. shoot. He's a, he's a very good shooter. Uh, obviously went off Ooh. to college and, and shot really well for a big man. So potentially his ability to space the floor might be something that Gorgian likes. Uh, so look, for me or for anyone out there, I don't see anything wrong with starting him. 69K, put him in your forward line. If it comes to round one and we see that Gorgian actually wants to run a bit of a tighter rotation and he slips out, well, guess what? You just move him on to someone that we find out in round one is going to play or has a better role around that 69K role, uh, mark. Sorry, Because there will be, okay? We will see some players in round one that we didn't think of or that we weren't too sure about actually solidify their role. So feel, feel free to put him in your team. And if it works out, it does, great. If it doesn't, Again, just trade him out. Yeah, that's a that's a very fair call. As you as you've already touched on, obviously in this format, you know you, you can have those shorter plays. If you miss someone early, it's not a oh no, I've got a waste to trade to bring him in. That we've got the trades to use it or lose it. Uh, the boosts obviously a little bit different, but yeah, say you start a, a Henschel or some other people we might touch on uh, a bit later on at that sixty nine k price, and you see week one. That uh, Lu- Luape Le Pepe <laughs> Kelly's coming out and he's he's got he's got the role and he's actually putting up good numbers. Then it's not hard to switch across or even downgrade someone to him. So I think that probably covers off the Kings in terms of the main relevancy. We've got the top dogs, the lower down, and the central lock in Cam Oliver. Anyone else from the Kings you want to touch on, Boz? Or no, I'm more than happy to move past the Kings. I think. Cool. All right. So we may, well, may as well just go in the reverse alphabetical order then seeing as we've done Tassie and Sydney. So next up is a team that is quite interesting with quite a few different options. We've got the Southeast Melbourne Phoenix. So I've got a team that uh, has two of them in it and I've got one where I don't touch them. They've got some interesting prospects. They obviously played some preseason games at the Blitz and also beforehand against, I believe, Brisbane and Melbourne. I'm pretty sure there was that crazy you know, 120, one to 120 double OT preseason game, <laughs> which is insane. But um, yeah, so the because of some of those things, the minutes have been a bit skewed. So someone like a Derek Walton Jr., who is their most expensive player and probably has the highest scoring potential, only played in two of the three blitz games. In that, he played, I think, one half in one of them and kind of like nearly three quarter or touch and go 18-ish minutes or so for the other game. So it's hard to know based off that. They haven't really rolled out every – they haven't had the chance, I guess, to roll out everyone fully and they've gone full pelt yet. He's someone that could be an interesting look, whether you go with the Cotton and then trade down or um, perhaps start with him for their first couple of weeks. He's, he's someone that we know can put up numbers. He's a great facilitator and can be a great scorer, you know, a 40-piece of his own. I, I like the look of him, and I definitely would be interested in him in, in, a, in a role. How, how do you feel about him paired with someone like a Sobi? Well, that's the whole question around it. I currently, in both the teams, will be selecting Derek Walton Jr., um, yeah. I loved him when he played in the league years uh, a couple of years back. I, I yeah. watched his blitz games, and in those small amount of minutes, he did enough. He showed that yeah. he could put up stats really quickly, um, steals, assists, uh, and points, which is obviously, you know, your assist and steals are a gold mine in, in this format. Now, there's the hesitancy, Sobi, right? So Sobi comes from Brisbane, yes. where last year he didn't really have any other guards to compete with. And Sobi took a lot of shots. And, and even in this blitz so far, it's always been kind of Sobi being, uh, you know, one of the top three kind of shot takers a game. But I think mm-hmm. what he's still drawing me back to Derek Walton is he can score in other ways. It's those high assists uh, and high steal numbers that he, he does really well and consistently. So I think, you know, if there are games where Sobi is more ball dominant, well, you're just hoping that Derek Walton's the one passing it to Sobi. And if he yeah. knocks the shot down, well, then you get the assist. So in terms of that risk that, you can take, I'm going to be probably doing Derek Walton as my risk um, just because it's a little bit cheaper than Cotton. 
um, has that early double. I don't really want to trade him in for his double. I kind of want to have him and then maybe fix my team up around him. Uh, yep. So for me, Derek Walton is someone I will be selecting. But again, have seen many teams kind of negating Derek Walton, not wanting to go near him due to that Sobe factor. But also kind of seeing that what we, I think it's Wise Camp or Wies Camp and also Hurt. Um, yep. They're doing all right as well. Like they're they're producing. Yeah. They they've produced really well. And um, I've seen a few teams on, on out on our Super Coach Hub Discord that have actually got Hurt and Wise Camp or just one of the or the other. So. Looks to me that Sam might have actually some other options other than Sobey and, and Derek Walton. Uh, but yeah. being those two high-priced kind of premiums, um, I would trust Derek Walton more than I would Sobey. But again, Sobey could come out and take 20 shots and hog the ball. Who knows? <laughs> Sobey will have games where, I guess, similar to what I said about too, but Sobey will be the top scorer for the Phoenix, maybe even for the round. He'll have some big games, but... Yeah, his efficiency hasn't always been there. Uh, not since his Adelaide days anyway, where he was running point, getting triple doubles and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I, I think Sobe does diminish Walton Jr. I think if that guard was a, maybe like say a Tyler Harvey, another shooter that doesn't need the ball to, you know, to just, I, to to knock Sobe, it doesn't need to hog the ball. I think that it would be an like a must have. It's someone that, yeah, I'd strongly considering. But uh, for anyone looking at Sobe, uh, probably similar to what we've said about some other players, unless you're a big big Nathan Sobe fan, probably a good one to miss. But you, you already touched on our Wise Camp and Hurt. If you had to pick one, who do you like the look of more? Obviously, you've got one that they can both shoot, but one is lights out shooter. Uh, and the other is more getting those rebound numbers for double doubles. What what If you had to pick one, who would you be uh, advising people to go for? Yeah, it's a great point. I think... With Hurt, those rebound numbers are quite high. And I think he's a bit more of a consistent shooter. Not to say that he can shoot the lights out, but, you know, you probably can get a consistent 14, 16 points a game from him. Uh, The only thing is, didn't actually see big rebound numbers in the Blitz, I don't think. So, you know, there were games where he racked up between maybe four and six rebounds, but there wasn't a game where I was like, wow, this guy's done a ton of grows and gone and got, you know, um, a 7.12, 13 rebound game. So, look... His G League numbers or his college numbers hurt. He he showed he can rebound, and I think he was averaging a double double, but that so. hasn't yet hasn't yet translated. With Wise Camp, it's kind of what I noticed with him was it's it's similar to kind of like a Gary Brown from last year. You're either putting up 25 points or you literally can't hit a shot, and you're putting up four points. Now, the one thing I do like with Wise Camp, and I have mentioned this on Twitter, I think it was about a week or two ago, that he actually has. Uh, so great steal and block stats. And I know that's coming from the G League, but he did average um, just under one a piece. So he was averaging 0.9 blocks, 0.9 steals in the G League last season. So if that yep. could translate on those off nights where, you know, him, his shot might not be falling and he's going through a tough time, you could probably still bank on Wisecamp getting a decent score based around on a, a few rebounds and a couple of steals and hopefully a block a game. But if you're someone that likes to get your points from someone scoring, um, it'd be a nervous week-by-week watch, I think, with Wise Camp because he showed in the blitz where he had his first game, he hit 20-odd points, and then his second game, and then he only had four or six. So, look, if you're a safe player, hurts. If you're someone that likes taking a risk on maybe a ceiling, I will probably um, uh, uh, recommend Wise Camp. I think you've summed it up perfectly, especially based off their points too. The the higher ceiling was Wise Camp and the the more consistent stuff was hurt. So that I think is the perfect way to put it. I I haven't decided if I'd go with one of them or not. If I, if I did in that, uh, as I mentioned, if I had a couple of Phoenix players, it would be, yeah, Derek Walton Jr. Along with one of them, but they've, they've got a couple of uh, cheaper options as well. How do we feel about Angus Glover as a benchy? Well, I think, yeah, Glover's obviously got a great pedigree behind him playing at Sydney in the past. And I think he was, you know, pushed for opportunity or pushed out of opportunity, I should say, last year. So I think he's done the smart thing for his career um, moving elsewhere. And and it looks like he'd be rewarded with, you know, a consistent probably 18, 20 minutes a game. And, um, you know, Glover can at times do more than just shoot the three. I think he's known very much for shooting the three. But I think there are... There are games we've seen where he's been able to kind of add a couple of rebounds, add potentially a couple of assists um, to his stat line. And, and for an 110K player, all you're wanting him to do is score, you know, roughly 10 to 12 points a game to make that money. So I think Glover's role is really, really safe. 
I think I still have him behind Hickey, who I'm sure we'll talk about it at Illawarra, just because I think Hickey's job security in terms of minutes is a bit better. I think Hickey will be that six man that gets 20, 25. Whereas I can see Glover at times maybe only getting 12 minutes to 15 minutes a night based on, you know, kind of result, matchup, et cetera. So Glover is still a very safe option. Uh, but if you're choosing between, let's say, him and Hickey, I probably would choose Hickey. Um, but that's just me. Yeah, no, 100% agree. Uh, not the Illawarra bias at all, but definitely agree there. Uh, with with Glover just touching on their rotation, so until the last game that they played in the Blitz where they obviously didn't roll out any of the bigger dogs and got, or many of them, and got destroyed, Glover and, oh, excuse me, yeah, so oh, why, why am I having a blank? Of his, uh, I'm having a blank of his name. Oh, Foxwell. Oh, I'm Foxwell. Foxwell. Yeah, so Glover and Foxwell, they seem to be the ones that are going to have that backup guard rotations locked down. Ben Eyre, who was that last year, aside from in that most recent game where he did knock down his shot really well, as he usually does, seems to be out of the rotation. And I think the, the playmaking of Foxwell and Glover's defensive abilities and along with his ability to make the shot probably have them over the top. So their roles... Well, the role for Glover does still look good, but I do agree about uh, in comparison to Hickey, who we will definitely be speaking about soon. It was a Malik Lewis for the for the Phoenix did some all right things. It's hard with the next stars, obviously, especially the younger ones, how they're going to transition into unless your name's Lamelo Ball or Josh Giddy, how you're going to transition to the the league playing against the men. And especially if you haven't been playing FIBA stuff before, how do you associate, you know, uh, get accustomed to that FIBA style of play? Is is Malik Lewis someone that we could start as a next star, or maybe he's a bit more of a wait and see? Do you think? Oh, it's a tough one. I think I tweeted out maybe a week ago that I currently had him in my team, and I think that was off his second blitz game where he put up a really nice stat line. I actually got to watch that game. Uh, I like his kind of length. I think he's got really long arms. Be really good defensive player. Uh, he obviously needs the minutes to to kind of promote himself to scouts and agents out there. So, look, I think Phoenix will give him the minutes, but there are a couple of games, I think the first and the third blitz game, especially that third one where, you know, they rested a few plays and he really should have kind of maybe taken a bit more of a leap. He really yeah. didn't do much for me. He kind of just put out the same 12 to 15 super coach points, which, look, it's still enough at a 115K price, but I think there are better options out there. And I think there's a better next start out there that I'm, Sure, we'll talk about when we come around to Perth. There's a bit of a spoiler. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you there. Uh, exactly with what you said too. I would have loved to have seen him do more in that third game, but he actually did worse, at least in the Supercoach sense, in that game that you were speaking about where he had that that good one. So it's it's a shame. And like a lot of the younger guys, he'll have ups and downs, but uh, definitely not someone to shy away from, but there potentially is some better options. The... The next team is someone who we don't really want to talk about because they have a terrible schedule, but we will still touch on them, the New Zealand Breakers. So I think the only thing you could do, I, I, I wouldn't advise this, but I have seen people do is the starting the Parker Jackson Cartwright and then trading immediately. I know you guys spoke about it and if issues arise, you might get stuck, but... Yeah, I think he's the only one we can look at now. But based off their blitz and preseason performances, there's definitely guys to look at when they come back in. It's round five where they come back straight into the doubles, I'm pretty sure. There's uh, there's a few names to look at. Obviously, Mitch McCarron has been playing really well, chip on the shoulder, getting more opportunities and back to the, well, obviously he's a bit older now, but back to that money-making days at Cairns and then the early Melbourne season. So he's someone that I'll be looking at when they come back through. Mooney took over a fair bit and had a really big game without PJC and an all right one in game two. Is he someone that when they, the schedule opens up, when they come back, would you look at him as perhaps that uh, base import price? Absolutely. I think we saw last year that, you know, Lamb and PJC were both able to put up massive super coach numbers, you know, working together. And I know Lamb's more of that three, four type kind of player and Mooney's probably more the two, the shooting guard. But I think it shows that, you know, PJC, doesn't well, I mean, I think for New Zealand to win, he does have to do a lot, but he doesn't have to do too much kind of scoring. He's a very good playmaker, PJC. Um, and I think Mooney can kind of bounce off him in terms of super coach production. So I think that would be the two that I would be targeting as soon as they get back from the US in round five with that lovely schedule they have. 
Uh, but what was in interesting to me was Gillespie. I thought he played really well, yeah. and then he just went and um, headbutted Sean Bruce, which I'm sure many people would want to do because Sean Bruce does seem like the annoying <laughs> type. But, you know, just such a stupid thing to do when the team's had such an awful preseason, and I think they were yeah. finally becoming a bit more competitive and probably finally starting to gel. Um, and it looks like that, you know, might obviously damage their round one hopes. And who knows how team chemistry is affected I mean, the locker room from a guy doing that, especially an import that you're probably paying a lot more than some of the younger guys on that team. Yeah, exactly right. And I think the issue too with New Zealand, especially when, not saying that they're superstars, but they've got a couple of, well, I mean, if you include Bolden, they've got three very capable big men in Bolden, Menenga, and even Dane Pino. Like they, if someone that's supposed to be a leader there, one of the one of the main boys, both financially and in terms of skill and and experience it, it is tough when they're doing stuff like that the obviously if you listen to some uh of the other punters out there he may not be around for a while so we'll have to wait and see if anything eventuates there but uh yeah he he put up a, a, a some good numbers uh in that game too where he uh where he had that the ejection he was doing pretty well i think he still finished on 31 super coach points something like that despite obviously missing you know the last chunk of the game it's a, it's a shame, but uh, especially with him. So for those that are new to, well, maybe new to Supercoach at all, or especially looking with the schedules of this, obviously we don't have prices change until after they someone's played three games. And because of the doubles and how it works, that means for him, his price would change at the end of the round that they come back like everybody else. But I think, oh no, that wouldn't change anything. They're single, single, blank, blank, double. So yeah, so he would be the same as everyone else. So you wouldn't need to worry too much about that. But yeah, I don't know. We don't need to touch too much more on the breakers, not for a few weeks anyway. Now is uh, the time for definitely a couple of names we've already mentioned uh, from the Perth Wildcats. Someone who I, th I, I think they'll definitely be top four again. Um, and I think that some younger guys are going to help them get there. Do we just want to start straight on uh, Henschel? We're obviously comparing him to uh, Luape, Lu Lu Pepe, <laughs> to Kelly as well as the the guy to start at sixty nine k. How did is he probably the front runner? Do you think? Absolutely. I mean, besides Oldrich, I think he's the second kind of player in the league that has the potential to to break out this year. Henschel, so yeah. you know, showed glimmers last year, especially in the preseason and that round one matchup against Sam pretty much just got benched for the rest of the season um, and, and and saw maybe a couple of junk time minutes towards the end of the year when their final spot was sewn up. But I think what we've seen this year, and I think it was Pleb that put out the statistics, um, Henschel played, I think, seven extra minutes on average this blitz. So that to me is already a great sign. If he's playing seven more minutes than what he played last year, that gives me a little bit more confidence that they are prepared to run him in the regular season. Now, again, we were pretty confident last year and the exact same thing happened where he played and then was rested. So this is a risky one. This is one of those ones where, you know, if you're picking him, be prepared for him to come out and give you a 30 and you think, wow, you know, 30 points on my bench. That's awesome. But also be very prepared for him to not get any minutes in opening round. Um, honestly, like be prepared for that. So, you know, 41% owned. Um, so if he does hurt you, he's hurting a lot of other people at the same time. Someone who I currently have purely on ceiling, I think he would score, if I compare him to Cali, I think he would score more than Cali um, on average, but a very, very nervous wait. I'll be literally reading every single article I can throughout the week, seeing if John really will give out any um, kind of ideas as to who he might be um, playing. Yeah, that's that's going to be the key. If he if he gets the minutes, we know he's going to be a, a an absolute slam dunk pick. It's it's just if there's any questions. And one thing that actually is both positive and negative is Elijah Pepper played really well as well. He's another sixty nine k player from the Wildcats. He doesn't have the DPP eligibility like Henschel though, which I think is another thing that gets him over the line. But he put up some pretty good numbers as well. So in terms of averages over the blitz yeah Henschel went at 20 just over 25 and Pepper went at 19 so they they got it and I I did some uh, some minutes not for every player but for the key players Henschel was miles in front of minutes played he played uh 115 minutes over the preseason Pepper put it played 96 but there you had guys like 
you know, Pinder played 90, Cotton 86. So they, they definitely got the burn in the preseason, as a lot of youngsters do. Just uh, hope that it can translate into the uh, the real thing. Yeah, absolutely. I'm holding hope that it does, and I'll be sticking firm with that pick, I think. Yeah, I like it. I like it. He's um he's, he's on my guard bench currently, so hopefully we don't have any reason to change that because I'm sure, as you said, he'll uh, burn a lot of people if we do. <laughs> Talking of another youngster who got a little bit of a tease earlier as the preferred next star option, the Spanish man, Almanza. Why Why are you thinking he's the number one next star? What, what are your thoughts there? Well, I just look at their roster and I think, you know, Pinder can't play 35 minutes and I don't think he wants to slash does because remember last year, I think Pinder kind of averaged only around that 25 minute mark. And, you know, you had Sar last year as that like for like center that came in and would play that 15 to 20 20 minutes, and I think Al is the exact same. I think it's just a like-for-like like swap. Sar goes out, Al Mansa comes in, and I think he's shown some really, really good kind of games. He, he's put up, I think, a game where he scored. I know probably Pinder only played maybe 15 minutes in this game, but I think he put up 20 and 9 in one of the games and, and got some blocks and, and, and assists as well. So he's definitely a high-quality basketball. I played for the G League Ignite, if I'm um, not mistaken, last season. So someone who I think can have that impact that someone like a Bobby Clintman who came in last year and did really well for Cairns straight away and Alex Saar, obviously, um, you know where he is now, number three pick or number two pick in the NBA draft. There's no reason why Amansa can't come in and have an immediate impact. So he's currently on my forward bench. Yeah, I like it. And obviously he's another one with that. Uh, he, he's, he's forward center, isn't he? So he's got that flexibility Correct. for switching around, which is uh, also very handy, the DPP. Yeah, I, I like him. That game that you were mentioning, I think it was 32 super coach points he put up. So in in games like that where you'll probably have a few of those throughout the year, that's a that's a good ceiling from someone so cheap, which is just like we were saying with Henschel. So cheap guys with big ceilings are definitely the tick. But I think if you obviously he's a little bit more expensive, but uh one would have a more guaranteed role, as you said, with with Perth's big stocks. No, Wagstaff's 87 years old. Surely he can't keep doing what he's doing. I know. I think this will be his last year. But um, yeah, even David uh, Aquera, he's not, you know, going to be necessarily a premier guy. Maybe won't get too much burn. So he's he's got a lot of opportunity. Hopefully, uh, he can he can take it and run with it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think he gets every right to have that first crack. I know last year when Perth got in trouble early in the season with wins, they did fall back. Um, on Jesse Wagstaff, and it actually kind of worked for him. You know, he brings that toughness, that veteran look. He doesn't miss a shot. I, weirdly, whenever I watch Perth and Bryce kicks out to Wagstaff, he just it's going in every time. So I can see why they ended up running with him a fair bit more last season. But hopefully this season they don't want to rely on him too much. Maybe they just want him around the locker room and they hope that they can get yeah. off to a good start and hopefully our man's is a part of that. Yeah, hopefully so. It's uh, it's a If you're a Wildcats fan, I think there's definitely a lot to look forward to this year. With uh, you touched on Pinder before, I've seen a few people wanting to go the start with him. Obviously, they've got that home game round one. They have the double in round three. A few people thought they could maybe pivot him with someone else on their bench. I I loved Pinder obviously as a lot of us did uh, in the in the Cairns days. He was a very fruitful f- fantasy player then. I don't know how he's going to go consistency wise this year. I think he's going to be a bit of a yo yo. He'll have essentially just like the Blitz. I know minutes were a bit different, but he'll have a game where he puts up 40 and another game where he has 13 super coach points. Is is Keanu Pinder someone that people should look to perhaps avoid or are you okay with someone going the pump with him? I think as a starting pick, look to avoid, but keep a very keen eye because I do like Pinder's game. There were, there were times last year where I was very tempted. You're right. You see that one yo-yo game that's up here and yeah. you're so tempted. You're like, oh my God. You know, the steals, the blocks, the rebounds, the points, everything. His game is great when it's on. But then that next game, he puts out like a 10. And you think, wow, I've really gotten sucked in here. So he's that kind of super coach player that, you know, you want him when he's up, but you do not want him when he's down. And I think there's far too many times, especially in double game week. So, like, he might put up a 35 performance in the first game week, and then you're looking at a 70, and then he puts up eight in the next, and then you only yep. got, you know, 40 points from him in, in a double game, which is obviously not good enough. So, look, avoid at the start, in my opinion, but keep a keen eye for a nice Perth run. And if you find some consistency, if he's, if he's fit into the team a bit better this year, by all means, have a go. But definitely be careful. 
yeah, I think that's that's a good call right there. His, uh, we, I guess the last thing probably to touch on with Perth is what is dividing a lot of the competition. Do you start with Bryce Cotton or not? He's obviously, what is he, a four-time, four or five-time MVP, few-time championship winner, grand final MVP, absolute stud, one of the best the league's ever seen. Is he someone that is worth that price tag or is the money perhaps spent spreading it out elsewhere? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it's, it's just so tough because you, you can see what Bryce can do on any given day and he puts up single game weeks where he's outscoring people on double game weeks. And that's actually, um, you know, kind of come and bitten some of the top players on the backside. I know last year, I can't remember who it was, but a guy in that fourth or fifth range kept him on all these singles and Bryce just went on a tear and actually ended up scoring better than the kind of key targets on the double game week. So uh, you know, at any given time, Bryce can explode. But, you know, for that 448000 um kind of price tag, what's the rest of your team looking like? You know, is Bryce going to be guaranteed in round one to make up all those points? Because if he has a, a bad game and he did have – they had a double game week round one last year and one of those games he was poor. If he does yep. that by chance, uh, you know, that could really, really hurt to start your season, especially if you're someone who plays for overall, um, you know, just is it worth the risk? I don't know. I can't do it. I'm a safe player. I like playing safe with a couple of risks, but educated risks um, when it comes to the price of players. And 448K to me is just too ridiculous for me. Yeah, I I, I did toy with it. And I, I won't say I'm 100% against it, but it's it's probably in the 90% chance it wouldn't happen. Lo- love him, a superstar. He's just that touch overs. It's kind of like for anyone that plays FPL, you've got, Harland that was say 15 million, which is ridiculous for a couple million less. You got a little bit more to play with. I think if, if cotton was around the 400 even mark that he'd be a, a close to must start. Cause that extra 50 K very much could be used elsewhere, but yeah, it's a bit too much for my, my liking, unless you're confident that he's going to go big, very big, like top scorer week one. So you've got him as captain and you can cover him in that double week with a, maybe a good rookie that we might speak of later, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I couldn't advise people to do it, but I also couldn't talk you out of it. It's probably one of those ones, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not here trying to tell you what to do in that area. Again, if you have a team and I've seen a couple of teams that don't even have a 69 K player and they have Bryce Cotton as a starter, which I found was incredible. Yes. A couple of guys on Twitter hit me up when I was speaking yeah. about it saying we've managed to actually work a team around Bryce um, that we enjoy. So if you, you're comfortable with your structure and, and how things look and you've planned ahead, go for it. Put in Bryce because, you know, Hoops Fest in Perth round one on a Friday night against Sam who have leaked points in the Blitz, he could explode. Yeah. He could literally play 35 minutes and go for 35 points and a few assists, few steals, et cetera. So could be a massive play to start your year, but also at the same time could be a big one that could bite you on the backside. Yeah, I think so. I think that's exactly it. It's going to be inc- the either an incredible choice or backfires big time. But that's that's probably the main guys to discuss with Perth. the The next next team up is probably the most relevant, as they usually are, due to their early schedule with the Australian Open. But we've got Melbourne United. There's a lot of a uh, lot of guys who a lot of relevant names here. Uh, and one of the team options, I think I have four or five guys, but that's probably a little bit too many. But um, you've got you've got to have some Melbourne in in your roster with how they've got. Obviously, they've got the back to back doubles in weeks two and three. It means you you don't need to waste trades early on them, uh, barring injuries or anything like that, of course. But the the issue that Melbourne have is there is a lot of mouths to feed at very important positions. Through the blitz, we didn't really see Chris Golding very much. And we only saw Delhi for parts of it throughout the preseason. If people are looking to start Melbourne guards, do you advise them to go anyway if they have to pick one or two out of the the Golding, the Delhi, Shaley, Ian Clark? Have you got a, a preference or feeling of what way people should go there, Boz? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm leaning heavily to Shay Illy just for the price point at 250k, and he. He's another one, just like Derek Walton I touched on before, great with his steals and assists. Doesn't need a high point um, to obviously score good super coach. So I think someone like Shay Illy at his price is great. Daly, of course, had a pretty good year last year. I was a bit surprised that he was over 300K to start this season. 
uh, potentially super coach did that on purpose just to kind of maybe, you know, steer some people away from picking Delhi. Uh, Delhi's blitz was a little bit up and down, didn't play a couple of games, played a few, looked pretty good in most of them. You know, it's Delhi, come off the boomers, you know, he's still a high quality player. So I think if there was two guards, it'd be Illy and Delhi. Ian Clark off the bench, I don't think does enough. I know he started most of the blitz, but that's because Goulding didn't play. So I think Goulding takes his starting role there. And, and then Goulding is someone who, you know, he'll put up a 30-point super coach game, and that's because he's actually scored 30 points in a game. <laughs> um, doesn't do much else, Chris Goulding. And I know the commentators love him, and he's always in the MVP talks and things like that, which is great for him as a player. But in super coach, I just don't think um, you can trust a guy like that who, you know, can, again, just like a wise camp, potentially pull up one game and give you a five because he can't hit his shot. Yeah, he's, he's someone that will obviously have some high selections with people that are just fans of him or they're not necessarily the biggest super coach fans, but they know the NBL and they know that he's one of the phases of it. Um, yeah, it, it, it's tough. I, I couldn't go with him unless, you know, he had a few rough games, dropped a bunch of price and picked him up for a little bit of a schedule later on. But no, I, I'm with you. When When I did my first initial team when the game first opened, I picked two players that we'll speak about uh, shortly first, but then the third person that I picked was Delhi. I picked him straight away as the starting PG. I thought with their schedule, uh, he's obviously been playing, you know, with the Boomers. He's he's Delhi. He's he's just the Iron Man. He'll keep running. He'll keep diving on the loose balls. He'll do it all. He's got that better offense over the last two or three years. But yeah, the price tag for when you could go someone, which is what I've done in my team, go save that sixty odd thousand dollars and get Shaili who could put up obviously not maybe not quite on par but similar-ish numbers it's it's a bit hard to ignore but I think if you're a fellow Delhi lover as a lot of us are and you want to back him in it's not the worst call either with their early schedule too no of course not and the schedule helps right the schedule allows you to take those risks because you never know there could be a double game week where they do have a really great two games and give you that you know 55 plus kind of score that we look for in our double game weeks yeah yeah for sure uh i think the we we might not need to touch so much on this next man because i think he should be in everyone's teams as well uh jack white he absolute star he was good as a as a young rookie when he was playing for melbourne before he went off to do the uh, the stuff with the Nuggets and everything over in the US. He's shown exactly why. He's get, catching those high lobs. He's grabbing all the boards, putting a couple of blocks up there, putting up points. I think he's a, a no-brainer pick, and especially with their schedule, you you got to have him in there. Is there any reason why he thinks people could perhaps not look at Jack White? No reason at all. Just put him in there. Everyone's going to have him. So if he does stink yeah. it up by chance, it's not going to really affect you. Uh, just an easy pick for the first, you know, five, six, seven rounds. Set and forget, as they say. Yeah, uh, 100% with you. Now now we probably come to the most contentious part. We've, we've got the bigs. So we've got the man that's retired two years in a row and come out of it, but but only a couple of months ago was not quite – MVP level like someone else we're going to talk about soon over in the New Zealand NBL, but was absolutely dominating, putting up huge numbers across the board over there. And then someone like comparing him to Marcus Lee, who on his day is fantastic. He can, you know, chip away with points, but he's going to grab a lot of boards, get blocks. He's a good presence there. Through They had not similar numbers. One definitely performed better than the other throughout the blitz and the preseason, but I've seen a lot of people go with both or some go with one. Have you got a preference of how you want to go with the Marcus Lee, Rob Lowe situation? None. Hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm scared of it. It freaks me out. I, I had Rob Lowe for a while. I think I initially had Marcus Lee because, you know, being signed by Melbourne, you think, all right, the import gets signed. They're going to guarantee the start. Then Rob Lowe obviously starts in those preseason blitz games had Rob Lowe, and then in that last couple of Blitz games, I think Rob Lowe put up a bit of a stinker, but then in the last one, they timeshared basically identically, and they both put up decent games, but it's it's that rule that, again, it's who do you trust? Yeah. And for me, I would rather just, just take the risk on someone else um, and just fill another spot a little bit cheaper just to make sure I don't need them. Now, I know with the schedule, 
you know, you, you get those double game weeks where even if they do timeshare, one game each, they might actually have their best game. So you still might get some production from both. But if you're someone that would want one, uh, I would uh, – sorry, if you, sorry, if you were someone that doesn't want none like I'm prepared to do, um, I wouldn't pick two. I would have you kind of go back, check the stats, watch a bit of footage from what you know, who are you keen on out of the two, and just ride with one of those because – um, I'm not here and I'm not prepared to try to say who I think will score better because I generally don't know. That's the most biggest tongue twister of the preseason for me, those two. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a real toss up, especially like you said, the the minute share they've had. There's been some games, I mean, I know some fouls issue have come into play, but there's been some where you think Lee's the one that they've given the preference to and then other where it's been low. Yeah, it's a bit tough, I, especially with a team like Melbourne that has, often they can run that four guard sort of rotation and, do that with a Jack White. I feel like you that there'll be a lot of times where both of them will be sitting on the bench, so they might not be as fruitful. And very much from experience, uh, you can sometimes go these cheaper guys because they have the good schedule on doubles and they just don't get the minutes or they do and they just don't perform and you were better off with a better cash cow or something anyway. So, yeah, I, I, I'm i undecided what I'm going to do, but I also, yeah, I agree with you, Boz, if you're in the way, if you if you want to go with neither, that's that's also a very viable strategy as well. And there's nothing wrong with, sorry, just before we go on, there's nothing wrong with starting none and then let's say in round one against Tassie on Thursday night, they do lean towards one or you get a better idea because they probably will have their whole roster as to who's going to get. There's no, there's nothing wrong with just trading them in in round two when they do have their doubles because their price wouldn't have changed yet. So you can just get them in and say, look, marked up a pick, that's okay. Get them in in round two, get the obvious price rise, and then you know hopefully you pick the right one from there. Yeah, it's a great call for sure. It's uh, advice for people, as probably touched on a couple of times. So yeah, definitely keep that in mind. We've got the trades to use. You don't need to be too concerned if a pick or two doesn't work out or there's someone you missed because you can just jump straight back on them, especially the cheaper guys like this. I, I think now we're probably at the, the best team of the league from my biased opinion. So the the Cinderella story of last year, the uh, the Illawarra Hawks who were on the canvas, five wins out of 30-something games, and then Tatum takes over and they go on an absolute tear. But more importantly for us, they have got some very, very, not just viable, but must have great options for super coach. So you've already mentioned him. I'll let you take away with Will Hickey, mate. Yeah, Will Hickey, I guess someone that early days last season didn't play much, but then won the trust of Tatum, it looked like, and, and was that kind of real prominent starting two guard. So he would start next to Tyler Harvey, but also would come off the bench as that six, seventh man. I know Justin Robinson would come off the bench in the guard rotation as well. But yeah, Hickey just has that, you know, that dog in him, as they say in, in um, the NFL. Um, he just puts it out on the floor. He's kind of like a dally. He will always put his body on the line for the team. He's a player that coaches one out there. But I think, yeah, I don't know, ever since the, the back end of last, he's actually not just that scrapper, but he's actually putting some stats on the board. So um, he had a really good kind of end to the campaign. Did he play in the three-on-three -three basketball tournament for Australia? In he the did indeed, yeah. So he played with Blanchfield there and he was, uh, I don't was I don't know if it was the MVP of the tournament or Blanchfield. One of them was MVP, but Hickey definitely played really well over there as well, which uh, yeah, is so obviously good, gives him some confidence. Absolutely. And then in the Blitz, we've seen him playing high 20 or maybe mid 20s minutes and producing, um, scoring, assisting, some high turnovers in some games, which is worrying. But you've got to look at it this way, guys. He's 106K. So all yep. you need from him is that 12 for him to go up in price in round by round, obviously, his third game. So with that early double game week in round two, uh, that's why I think he's probably a no brainer to slot in at your bench guard spot, especially over uh, who we touching on before from Sam. Uh, oh, Glover. Glover. I think he's better than Glover as an option. Yeah, definitely. And uh, obviously, you know, he, he's someone that not just you see how Tatum's put that faith in him as well, but it, it paid off, not just on the offensive end, but, you know, he, well, he, he tired, sent, sent the game to overtime in game two versus Melbourne. He made some incredible plays across the final series in crunch time where it mattered. So we know that he's got the, the trust to be out there in important moments. So he's someone that you can feel pretty confident in there, but uh, defensively too, in, in their games, they swept Perth last year and he was a big reason why with uh, stopping cotton going large. So 
he's got multiple roles. He can be that backup point guard. He can be the defensive stopper and just that all round hustle, high energy guy. So he's definitely, I I would put him as the easiest pick. Um, the next player we probably talk about, some might say would be, but they're right up there. So from one cash cow to another who has been quite dominant NZ NBL MVP has been really good in preseason and the blitz. We've got Lockie Olbrick. Now, do we need to discuss more about Olbrick or do we just, just have people put him in their teams? Yeah, not really much discussion needed. Lock him in. What I will say is it's great that he's, well, it's not great, but the fact that this import days has come in and he's now taking the starting role means that Olbrich and Hickey are going to play a lot of that kind of pick and roll play together. And I think that actually benefits both of their scores. So, I think we saw in that last Blitz game, both Hickey and Oldrich actually went bananas uh, because there are times where Froling and Days will be off the court, as well as obviously Tyler Harvey, Trey Cowell. Uh, and that's where Hickey and Oldrich are probably the two that are pretty much putting up a shot every possession for that team. So I think that'd be cool to see how those two work as a dynamic uh, this year. And yeah, a no-brainer. Lock him in. Perfect. Yeah, we don't need to go too much. If, uh, if you haven't already, make sure you adjust it and get him in. The, the interesting one that you just mentioned, Darius Days. So new signing for the Hawks in one of the rare scenarios where you play against someone and then within a couple of weeks you're playing with them. Um, it, it, he's obviously there. And as a, as a Hawks man, I hope he can get maybe not quite there, but if he can get close to Gary Clark numbers for both the Hawks and for Supercoach, he could be a very good pick. I've seen a lot of people having starting him with that early double. Is is Day someone that we could look at? Absolutely. You know, you touched on the early double. That's obviously a win. He's 277K. He won't have gone up, okay, in price until that that double. He's someone who it looks like rebounds really well at that four spot. So similar to Gary Clark. He's kind of like a like-for-like like fit, it looks like. I think Gary Clark probably on talent and just overall maybe playmaking might have a little bit more than Days. But, you know, if Days can sit in that corner and, and hit the shot when it comes out to him before he can cut into the lane and receive that pass, whether it's from, you know, a Hickey, a Cal, or Harvey, even Froling loves to pass the ball as a big man. There's no reason why he doesn't get those double-double numbers. And for someone like me who really likes Froling, and spoiler, I have Froling in one of my teams to start, Ooh. I'm actually getting a bit nervous in terms of rebounding because I think I was banking yeah. on Froling being a bit more of a monster on the boards this season. But with days coming in, it feels like he might be a Gary Clark junior just stealing those rebounds for fun especially as someone else we spoke about but hickey and the guards out there the guards all like to rebound too you know you've got hickey lee even uh hopefully dan greeter gets back out on the floor those guys all love to grab the boards as well trey it's, uh, it, yeah or trey oh even forgetting trey hill yeah of course like they they've got a lot of options there it's not like uh, some other teams where the big man is just the main the main board guy, which is uh, a shame, obviously, for Froling. It's one of the things. I mean, not quite what Damon Lowry said, the 30 and 15 or whatever he wants him to do, but it would be nice if he could up that production. Do you, do you think that, uh, obviously, putting him in your team, is that hoping that uh, he does increase? I know he obviously did decently last year, but that he does increase on output. Is that one of the main reasons why you're going with Froling? Yeah, so initially... And he's going with Froling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that was one of the big reasons, you know, the ability to improve, still very young Froling. It feels like he's been around for a long time, but he's still, he's, I think he's only 23, 24. So still a very yeah. young young player, um, super talented. Was hoping the rebounds would increase. Potentially that's not the case. But what I've liked from him is his assist numbers have gone up. I think there's a lot of kind of, yeah. um, you know, using the big man uh, and then flashing to the corner and receiving it back from the big man, a lot of that kind of one-two play from the Illawarra in the preseason, which really makes – uh, following an option if he is going to actually, you know, kind of put up three, four assists a game. And with me and my super coach teams, I like tried and tested guys and following was someone I relied on a lot last year and he was really consistent. So he would always put up at least a 25. You would get those monster games where he might put up a 35 to 40, but he very rarely was he scoring less than 25. So I think to start the year, I'm looking for a bit of safety in areas where I am maybe be gambling in other areas. So with the Derek Walton Jr. kind of going for a bit of ceiling there. Having a, a frolling in that first round where it's all the single game weeks and that double game week in round two, just someone that I can really trust and someone that I've watched a lot of basketball be played by um, who I think will you know produce well enough for me. And then ideally, I just get him out in round three for another centre that's on the double. 
Yeah, I like it. I like it. He's uh, definitely a, a viable option, especially because he's only just that touch over 300k too. It's not like he's right up there with, say, a Xavier Cooks or one of those guys. So that makes it a little bit easier as well. With the with the guards, you, you mentioned Trey Kell. Definitely, if you were judging it on preseason form, you would not have liked what you saw from a super coach perspective. Obviously, meshing into a new system, getting that uh, continuity with the new teammates and stuff will take a little bit of time, but... He's he's got a bit of a price tag. Is is it is a trade kill someone that people could take a risk on, or should they just uh, avoid? Absolutely, you can take a risk on him. I know his preseason hasn't showed much, but if you were an avid watcher last year, you saw how ridiculous his end of the season was. When I think Adelaide maybe gave him a bit more of the keys to the point guard role. Obviously, yeah, yeah new team again, and I think we saw it at Adelaide last year. His first eight rounds, it was, wasn't even a target for anyone in Supercoach. Everyone was like, "Oh, yeah, same old trade Carl from Sam." You know, he's not doing much. He just fits in. He's getting paid. He's just filming a role. And then we saw him take it to that next level. So, look, me personally, I would wait. I would hope that price comes down. And then if Elawara have a really good schedule in the middle of the year and he's found that kind of space and role on that team, he can be putting up those ridiculous numbers that he was doing last year. He was he got a triple-double. That's so rare in the NBL. Yeah. He was triple-doubling <laughs> last year. That's how good he was playing. Oh, yeah, I was in the building that that uh, that day too. Who, um, yeah, he's... He's he's at his best. He's the perfect super coach fantasy, like the fantasy player you want. He he wants to get the boards, but also the cheap boards as well. Knows how to facilitate and put the ball in the hole himself. He's uh exciting prospect as an Illawarra fan, and yeah, as you said, potentially throughout the year could be an exciting prospect again for super coach. Is there anyone at the Hawks you wanted to touch on? Obviously, Harvey's there too. Been in a few people's teams I've seen as that early double. Uh, people have put like a Blanchfield or a Hung Jung Lee. I probably wouldn't go down that path but yeah any anything else that uh you want to touch on from Illawarra not really I think Harvey had a really good back end to the year so I think he's yeah. priced actually a little bit unders I think I think he will get better than that 280k that he's priced at but again with that early only one double I think there's better options you could start with from Illawarra uh, and then those bench guys you spoke about there's way better options out there like if you're choosing those guys over a, you know even like a Tui or a an old bridge uh, even a Henshaw, you know, a Cali, like I just wouldn't do that. It's not worth the risk. I don't think their upside's high enough. Nah, definitely. Especially for such a like deep spread team as well. You know, there'll be days where one of them will get minutes and then they'll sit on the bench most of the next game. So probably couldn't trust that. But um, a, a team that we were pretty high on one of their players as was very justifiable, who unfortunately isn't the case anymore. We've got Cairns who would be soon to be led by Taron Armstrong, but unfortunately not for the first couple of weeks. So not quite as relevant. You you touched on uh, Tanner Groves before. Big, big, big man, big beard, just grabs the boards, puts up scores. He, he knows what he's doing and he, he kind of, uh, they're different players, but he kind of reminded me of like the John Mooney. Like he's not going to score 25, 30 points, like actual points. But he'll get a double double almost locked in. I, I liked what I saw from him. What about the other imports, Bradshaw and Edwards? What do you what do you think about those guys? Yeah, I think Bradshaw probably showed more than Edwards. I think Edwards is kind of like a Chris Smith of Brisbane last year, but probably a better player. I think he's a bit more consistent than Chris Smith. So Edwards is really good at scoring the ball, but unfortunately it seems like that's really all he can do. And that's fine. Like Cairns will will think that that's a great addition to their team, which he will be, especially when Taron's running the floor. But for Supercoach, I think, you know, just banking on someone scoring a lot isn't the way I'd probably um, take my team. So, look, Edwards, fine player, but probably not the greatest Supercoach player. Um, happy to be proven wrong. Um, and then you got Bradshaw, who I've seen a lot of teams actually sneakily put him in. Now, I don't want to speak yeah. too much about him. He's not currently in my team, so I'm not trying to not say anything so no one picks him. But seems like there are a few people out there that want to kind of keep him on the down low. But he seems to be someone with Taron out looking like he's probably going to be, even though he looks like a 3-4 type player, so that kind of taller um, player probably could actually facilitate a bit uh, and yeah. actually put up some really nice stat lines in terms of your points, rebounds, assists, steals and blocks. Uh, his last season in his old league, he was great again with steals and blocks. There's a theme there. I really like players that are great defensively, um, obviously because they're, they're worth three points a pop. So if you can get a couple of steals or blocks of games, that's going to really help your um, overall super coach game. So I think out of those two, Bradshaw is a, is a genuine selection. I think I've seen a lot of 
um, people actually sneak him into their their forward or guard spot because he is that dual eligibility. So he's someone that, you know, if you're, your structure allows you to have two single game weeks with him to start and then you're happy for their double run coming up, feel free to start him. If not, wait till round three and if he's good, get him in. Yeah, I think you absolutely nailed it there. He's uh, an enticing prospect if as soon as that schedule is enticing, for sure. he And someone that can be pretty consistent too. I know we, we I mentioned it. We, you want guys with ceilings, especially for single game weeks. But if you've got someone... So Bradshaw, his scores at the Blitz, 26, 26, 27, ignoring that last game where he hardly played. But yeah, so very consistent. And that was with a lot of turnovers, obviously, without Taron. It's someone that, as you said, if you can afford to have it on the singles, not too bad. So so Cairns have also got... Uh, so I, I know I did touch on Groves, but did you want to mention anything more about uh, about Tanner Groves, the big man? Oh, look, not not too much. I'm, I'm a big fan of him. I have my one team where he's in it. The other team, he's unfortunately not. Someone I'll be keeping a keen eye on if I do go the way of not selecting him. Yeah. But definitely a, a selection that would be warranted to start with that double-double kind of factor. Um, if he is getting a double-double on those singles, you, you're pretty much getting your score to a point where um, it might cover, you know, not having someone on a double game week. So, yeah, Groves, a fine selection to start, in my opinion. Yeah, I like it. I like it. They've, they've got a couple of cash cows there. One that was very hyped early on, and I think people might have cooled off a little bit uh, in jo- Jonah Antonio. And then they've also got uh, a couple of forwards slash bigs in AK Gak, who put up some good numbers at times last year. And also Kyron Galloway making the jump across from Adelaide to hopefully get a bit more opportunity. Is Is there any of those guys that you're interested in or if you had to pick one or have you thought about any of them? Well, at the start of the Supercoach opening, I really liked Kyron Galloway. He was someone that, when given the opportunity in Adelaide, put up some really good Supercoach numbers. Preseason wasn't good enough, so I think, for me, Galloway is someone you just wait and see, have a watch. If he does come out and he takes that six-man role or that kind of first one off the bench in the forward slot, you know, you could potentially trust him. I think um, Jonah Antonio has become a relevant option purely because of Tanner – sorry, Tanner – Taron Armstrong uh, being injured to start the year. So, you know, I think if Armstrong was playing, he would be irrelevant, someone we wouldn't even be talking about. But the fact that there pretty much isn't a point guard on that team because of McCoy's two-game suspension for his DUI, Antonio is a fine selection. But again, you know, Antonio's, I think he's around that 85 to 90K mark. If you can spare another 16K, you got there's a Will Hickey there or there is also a a Glover as well. So I think they're better options uh, than Antonio. So I'd, I'd wait and see on him. And then lastly, you spoke about AJ uh, Gak. He he was fine last year when he got the minutes. I think he put up a couple of big games. Uh, yeah. But again, it's that Adam Ford, do we trust him? Um, you know, there's Groves, there's Bradshaw, there's Wardenberg. There's now Galloway as well who can play that four, five role, small ball five. I don't know. There's a lot, a lot going on up, up at the uh, four and five spot for Cairns that I'd probably, again, just wait and see on these guys. And I wouldn't be confident in any of them. No, I think that's fair, especially as uh, anyone that played last year and maybe knows the Josh Roberts roller coaster that we went on with uh, Adam Ford being the best man on the floor by a long way and then not getting minutes the next game inexplicably is is something that uh, Fordy might like to do. So it's probably good to avoid avoid a few Cairns players until we have a bit more of an idea. The we we touched on on the next team Brisbane quite a bit. Obviously, they have had the most prolific preseason schedule. They played the most games. Um, throughout, well, obviously the Blitz and in just general preseason games where they put a lot of their their cards kind of on the table. We've heard about uh, starting some of their their players, even though they have that not ideal schedule. Who who have you liked so far from the Blitz? Or have you got anyone that's locked in or you'd be avoiding from the Bullets? I think Locke is Zakarski in that centre spot. It's a no-brainer. Uh, I've seen some teams without him, and that's fine. I guess those single game weeks, you know, the cash generation might be slower than what we would like, but that's okay. I think Rocco at 99000 is a fine pick there. Prather, yeah, okay, 140k gets a little bit expensive. It's unders for who he is as a player, but with that yeah, schedule, sure. do you really just want to kind of churn away at um, him making money? Again, Josh Bannon didn't play in the Blitz. 
not to say that yep. you know he's going to take all his minutes, but he will be taking a chunk of those minutes. Not sure when he's meant to be back. Probably I would personally just skip on Prather until round three. If his first two games he puts out like two thirty fives and he's a must own, must you know own cash um, generating player, yep. then you just you, you find a way to get him in. You might use a boost or you might uh, maybe sacrifice getting in someone else for him. But he's someone I wouldn't really kind of aim at looking at early. And then lastly, who I like is, you know, Tyrell Harrison at 230K. I've seen some people starting him. Uh, yeah. It's, interest, it's interesting. But I guess if he's putting up the blitz numbers, he's popping up 35s and 40s. That's what you can get sometimes from a double game week. So there's no saying if – I don't think he averages 40, let's be honest. I think he's more about that 25 <laughs> average probably. But, you know, if he continues his hot form, there's no reason why starting him – wouldn't be a massive pod play, especially in round one with all those singles. Oh, I, th- I think that's the, the key thing too. Obviously, everyone's on the single round one. So if you've got someone that can put up some good scores and maybe you've got, maybe it's an old brick or someone that's on the, the center bench that can cover him with a double the next week, it, it's not the not the worst start. I, I spoke earlier about how Cam Oliver was ridiculous in his points per minute. The only player to eclipse him and who played a lot more minutes and a lot more games was Harrison. So... It is tough. You, you you look at how he, well he performed, and you go, "I need that in my team." But just the schedule is a little bit iffy. And as yeah. you as you mentioned, Bannon not being there when when Bannon's out there, obviously not saying that he'll take minutes at the five, but he's going to get more going to get boards. Is that going to take away from that Harrison ceiling? It's uh yeah, a bit of a, a watch this space, I think. Yeah, I actually did toy around with having Harrison in my team, and I worked it out that in round two you could put Harrison to the bench. And then if I had Al Mansa in the center spot, he could then switch with Cam Oliver, who Cam Oliver becomes your center. And then Al Mansa mm-hmm. swaps with Tui and then Tui becomes your double game week player in that round two. Um, therefore okay. allowing me to keep Harrison. But then again, it's not like Harrison has that double game week coming up. He's forever on a yeah. single until like round eight. So, you know, it might be something that gets you ahead early in the season, but once all those doubles start creeping up and there's a lot of, great centres like a Magne or a Groves um, or a Humphreys in Ransley with Adelaide getting those doubles, they're the guys you want because they will outscore Harrison guaranteed most likely on a double. Yeah, for sure. I, I They've got the imports there too, well, the, the new imports in Bateman and Cook. The, they had a couple of good – well, one had a good game at one game, one had a good game in another. Not, not too bad, but uh, I don't know with their schedule. I don't think they're all that relevant early on unless, as like you were saying with Prather, they really light it up in the first couple of weeks and you've got to get them in for the cash gen. But, yeah, I, I think we can probably steer clear of those guys. Any uh, Anyone else at the Bullets you might uh, might have an eye on? No, I like Isaac White's game. I think he's a good little guy, a bit of a pocket rocket, can get inside and score quite easily. I think he has a pretty good transferable super coach game, just needs the obviously the minutes, and that would be something I'll be watching yeah throughout the season until their doubles. But I'm not stressing any Brisbane players until they get relevant. That's when I'll be really kind of looking to put in those big dogs. Yeah, I think that's very, very fair. We probably don't need to touch too much more on Brisbane with their schedule. But uh, a team that is semi-relevant early on, especially for the first three weeks, uh, the final team, the Adelaide 36ers. So in Rabble, we've had coach firings, Imports have been let go last year. It hasn't been the greatest of 12 months, two years for the Sixers. But they, aside from the coach issue, they look to be kind of settled now. But then they bring in Montrez Harrell. So how, I'll, we'll just start off with that. Probably one of the one of the biggest signings the NBL's had. How do you think that affects the team? Well, I think it kind of takes out of consideration a Lat Mayan or a Nick Marshall in terms of a solid bench role in that forward kind of spot. Because I thought they could actually carve out a role if – they were just going to kind of put Joel Martin on the side and not bring in an import replacement. But I think now that they've obviously announced the signing of Harrell, I mean, he now becomes relevant. I know he's coming off an ACL, yeah. but I've played a lot of NBL, NBA fantasy, I should say, in the past. And as a six man at the Clippers, like he was just a great asset. He was a double-double machine, would come and, and bully all the, all the uh, bench players from the other opposition. So... There's no reason why Trez doesn't just come into the NBL and kind of dominate, similar to Tyler Cooks last year. I, I know um, yeah. Trez was seen, I think he put it on Instagram, that you know everyone's doubting him and he's really motivated and the goal is to get back to the NBA. So what better than to have you know eight weeks in the NBL where you can really showcase that and um, not to say he's going to be a selfish player, but you know, kind of, you know, kind of he'll get what he needs to get. He'll put up those 12 and 12 games if he needs to in a couple blocks. So I'm looking forward to seeing him. 
hopefully he's not as rusty due to the knee injury um, compared to what he used to be because he was he was very athletic. So yeah, fingers crossed he can obviously do bits for the league in terms of you know membership and jersey sales and um, you know watching of the game, but also super coach wise, I think he can put up some good scores. But I'll wait and see till they're doubles. Yeah, I think that's probably the safest way to go. Um, yeah, absolute machine. So hopefully you can get to somewhat of his, his heights here in the NBL. That'd be really, really cool to see. We don't obviously get to see... Well, we get superstars, but like people of his caliber, we don't get to see every every single year. So it's good when they come through. Hopefully they, he, can, uh, he can perform. But it's obviously a shame for the reason why is here. I mean, they do technically have an import spot up their sleeve if they wanted to release someone, if they could afford to keep him and you didn't get an opportunity, but him being here, obviously is Jarrell Martin, not. So I think Jarrell Martin is still in some teams. So if he is, you got to make sure you get rid of him. Now he's not going to be playing for, I think it's the first two months at least, but they're, it's one of those not guaranteed injuries where it could be a bit iffy. So make sure Jarrell Martin's out of your squad. But uh, someone who I think should be in your squad, either starting with potentially, but 100% come their double, uh, Kendrick Davis, absolute star. Uh, I know you mentioned earlier you love those guys that get the the steals and the blocks. I remember, lo- like, I always love those guys that come in and they're, yep, yeah, led the G League in assists, led this league in assists, kind of like what happened with Scott Machado coming in. Uh, yeah, Kendrick Davis, he he looks like he's got a great super coach game for us. What it, Do you think that uh, he's a viable starting option or do you wait a little bit? It's a tough one because he's a gun and we've seen his ceiling and he's put out 40s. So there's no reason why he doesn't match someone on a double game week. It's tough. I've toyed around with him being in my starting team. He's currently not in either of my teams, but he's the number one target for me in round three. There's no reason why... Yeah. I'm not getting him in round three. Could bite me in the backside, to be honest. He could come out and have those two really high ceiling games at the start of the year and those singles. He might come out and have a 40 and a 40. I'm not losing money on him, but I am losing points. So, you know, yeah. at the moment, I'm backing in a Shea Illy over him, and that's the, the choice I've had to make um, just based on the double in round two, okay? So yeah. I'm banking on Illy to pretty much outscore Davis in three games compared to Davis's two. It, they might be very similar. It might be 80 and 80 potentially, or Davis may actually potentially outscore Illy. But for now, I have not got Davis, but I can see why there's, you know, I think 20% of people that are starting him and there's a rightful reason for that. He looks awesome. Oh, yeah, definitely. So he's uh, he's, he's going to be one of the exciting players to watch both for us Supercoach fans and just uh, in the league in general, which is really, really cool. There's there's a couple other guys at the Sixers. You you hit the nail on the head earlier with uh with Montrose Harrell affecting Latmain and Nick Marshall's prospects. But uh there's there's another cheaper guy who has actually been pretty consistent and I think can do some things for us. It's uh old boy Jason Kadi. He he's he's had some some decent scores across uh for his price, especially across the blitz and preseason. Could potentially be one to to look at on the bench or to target when they have that little bit of that schedule flip. How do you feel about uh, the old sharpshooter? Well, I think last year, you know, Kadi and McCarran kind of just got in each other's ways. Not their own fault. Just, you know, they were both signed as those veteran guards and it's pretty hard to be relevant in a game like Supercoach when there's someone else who basically plays the exact same role as you. So I think touched on before, you know, McCarran's headed to New Zealand, bit of a chip on his shoulder wants to show that he can kind of get back to where he was when he played for United. Um, you know, there's no reason now why Kadi doesn't take, you know, not the entire backup kind of point guard minutes, but a, a decent chunk of that. And, you know, he can still contribute. You know, you'll get his eight points. He might get four assists. If you can chuck in a steal, well, I think what's he priced at? 119000 I haven't really yeah, looked at him. around that. That's my guess. Yeah, one nineteen five. Oh. Beautiful. I must have seen him when I was scrolling last night. But he's <laughs> definitely someone that could make you some early money. And and coming into that round three, if you were looking at downgrading or needing some extra money um, when they have their first run of double game weeks, and that's the first time they'll rise in cash as players, as uh, Adelaide will, Kade could be an option. So why not? Yeah, he's uh, he's one that I, I don't mind. I, I probably would, yeah, would probably wouldn't start with him, but I think he he could be definite option to look at for that uh that double week and i i wouldn't be surprised if he had a pr- pretty good negative break even come that week too so yeah he's he's someone definitely to keep an eye on 
The the last couple of guys, uh, they're two big dogs from last year. Obviously play, well, they're very different sized and very different players, but we've got DJ Vasilievich and Isaac Humphreys. Both are hefty in the price tag. Would you be looking at either of those guys or they're in a similar boat, especially with Montrez Howell coming in, maybe a wait and see? Yes, that's a good call. Because I think Humphreys without Montrez uh, and with Jarrell injured was a no-brainer on their doubles. Like, you know, he's a double-double threat. But with Trez coming in, just similar to Froling with Days, does that impact their rebound? So definitely a wait and see on him. But is he a great super coach player, Humphreys? Someone I owned a lot last year and really enjoyed watching as well. And then DJ 3J, you know, he has his games where he does uh, put up some stats, including rebounds, assists. But most of the time, he's that Chris Golding type, just a scorer, pure scorer. Look, unless there's a schedule or a round or a couple of rounds where Adelaide are one of the only teams playing the double and you really need to load up on their players, for sure, put in DJ 3J. But, you know, when there's other options out there and at his price, he's not going to produce enough, I don't think. No, I think that's a that's a fair call. I mean, I, I shouldn't say burnt, but last year I had him a little bit too when he should have really gone bigger and he just didn't quite perform. But... I, for, I guess a prime example. So in the the last game that he played for the Blitz, uh, he obviously didn't play in that blowout, but he played in the other one, 36 minutes, and he had 19 super coach points. So it's not exactly the great point per minute. <laughs> He's on the opposite side of that scale that we want. But yeah, I, I don't think that he... He's facilitating a little bit better, but with Kendrick Davis out there, and especially if they've got Montrez Harrell, who just can just grab it and go... Yeah, I don't think that he's going to put up the assist numbers, but who knows? He, he might might go really well, and he might be someone that we really need to look at come their, their double time. Yeah, absolutely. Is there is there anyone else from Adelaide that we want to touch on? I think we've probably covered most of the, the key players there. Yeah, I think the 36ers have been covered quite well. Cool. Well, I guess in terms of we've covered a lot of players across probably nearly all, if if not all of the relevant guys from each team. Is there anyone that we haven't discussed that maybe is a bit of a, a, a cheapy cash cow or someone that uh, we haven't talked about that we perhaps should be looking at? To be honest, I wrote a list down and I think we definitely have covered all of the players that I personally wanted to, to kind of cover. I think in terms of value, I think it's it's always those 277K import players, you know, they come in as an import price because they haven't played in the league before or they haven't been in the league for many years. So it's kind of everyone's guess as to who's going to kind of break out. Now, the reality is there will be some 277K guys that break out. There's going to be, yeah. I think we know that KD, Kendrick Davis will be one of those, but there are going to be other guys that end up being those must-have super coach premiums. But for us, it's that wait and see. So great. If you can get them in your team and hit them early, you've done a great job. But at the same time, if you're happy to kind of wait to see where the value lies, that's also a great strategy um, to have. Because I've got, you know, your Bradshaw, your Groves, your KD, Hurt, Wisecamp, all guys we've touched on, or that 277K mark. There's a huge chance that two or three of them are really, really good and must-haves, but there's also a chance that two or three of those guys become just role players for their team. So while it is well yeah. and good to kind of reach for the sky and, and try to kind of nail those guys down early, it is okay just to sit back work out who is actually the ones that are going to be in that 300K, averaging that 25-plus points that we want by the end of the year. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I think um, – and and to the flip side of that too, there's always going to be some that you think might go really well, and they're the ones that drop cash. So a, a prime example would be Christian Duda the last year. He was someone that dropped to from import price to like 150 or whatever it was, and then all of a sudden he was averaging – 30 odd points or super coach points a game and was a, was a must have. So it's, it, it's kind of like in the other fantasy sports at rookie roulette, this, this import roulette, there's going to be some that you're going to want, but you can't get the pop. And there's going to be some that you might go that don't. But as, as Boz said, as we've mentioned a few times, the, the luxury in this game is we have the use it or lose it trade. So you, if you, if you're on the wrong end, it's not too hard to switch across. So hopefully it's how it works out, but if not, it's not the end of the world. Absolutely, trust your gut, guys. Uh, yeah, oh, that's that's the that's the key thing. Unless unless you me, and usually the 50-50 calls go the wrong way. So maybe do the opposite to what I would do, and you'll be great. I, I think that 
we, we've probably gone over most. The only thing that we uh, haven't really discussed is captaincy options. So for round one, obviously everyone's on a single. It's all over in Perth. There's obviously a, a big standout if you go with a cotton build. I think you you, you you can't pick him and not captain him. Otherwise, just don't pick him. But who else are we thinking for captaincy? It's a great question. And you're right in saying that if you've got Cotton in your team, you have to captain him. There's no reason you have Cotton on your roster without wanting to put the C on him. And that's for double game weeks as well. There's no kind of question around that. Cotton is the best player in Supercoach and he often always is the highest scorer. Uh, obviously, the high price tag comes with that, but that's the reason why you're getting him in, to be that captain. So, yeah, Cotton's your obvious one. I guess Space Cam, based on his form um, in the Blitz, he... He's coming up against Adelaide, I believe, Sydney. So, you know, Adelaide, a team that don't bat too deep. And if he's coming off the bench, Humphreys may be getting rested at the times that he's on. Montrez, first game back in, let's say, nine months from an ACL. How long is he going to play? Is he going to play? I think they're saying he is, but, you know, how many minutes is he going to play? So I think Space Camp could feast on Adelaide. Um, did you have any thoughts, Phoenix, on my captain? Yeah, well, my my C, if I go with the team that I'm most likely to, the C's on Cam Oliver, um, for exactly as you just said, nailed it. If Even if he starts, he'll play those minutes too. So he's either going to have a, a tied Humphreys at points or he's going up against um, uh, Matt, Matt, uh, Starling. Starling, I'm trying to think. That's it. That's Alex yeah, Starling. Alex he's Starling. there. Back. Yeah, or he's going to go up against him or a very, very uh, underdone, Montrez. So I think that he's a really good option. It depends on the structure of your team. If you're going a team that I think well, we talked about uh, even on Twitter, the more import heavy team, you could go someone like a, like a Darius days or one of the guys that you think might pop. Maybe if you've got the same guys or, or a ton of groves, they're good options too. I, I think for the team that you've got and one of my options, uh, another great shout is probably the most expensive player in it in uh, Derek Walton Jr. He's he's a good a good option too. I I don't know if I'd go as Xavier Cooks if I had him. I like I said I did have him earlier in uh, in my team, but with what I've seen and it's a bit hard to know. But like you said, he could just come out and then light it up. So if you you've uh, got a bit of a hunch, go for it. But yeah, I think. The main thing is if you've got Cotton, there's no point having him if you're not going to captain him. And there's probably a few good other options as well. Is there anyone else that you might uh, might be a, might be a good shout that we haven't spoken of? I think if you're if you're gutsy enough, I mean Jack White's put up in a tremendous blitz, and it looks like he's Melbourne's focal point, you know, in that forward kind of position. So there's no reason why his form can't continue. And it looked like, um, well, last year Tasmania gave up. No points at all. They were probably the hardest team to score against. But it looks like in the preseason that, you know, potentially motivation isn't as high and they're maybe still trying to find their groove that potentially they might be an early team to target. But again, we haven't got the data. This is the whole thing with captaincy in round one. You've yeah. got to go for a guy that's that's tried and tested, in my opinion. So someone like a Derek Watton Jr. who you know has a high ceiling because he's played the format before. Space Cam, he's been in the NBL before. We know what he does. Cotton, we know what they do. It's all well and good to risk it and go risky. And I guess in a single game week, you can go risky because there's you know you're not losing too many points. But at the same time, you know, back in your gun, you've probably all got someone on your team that you kind of deem as your number one guy. For me at the moment, it's Doug Walton Jr. Uh, there's no reason why you just put the C on him. There's a reason why they're the high, highest price players, and hopefully they can kind of reward you for that that faith you show in them. Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a very good call. I I think as a as an alternative to, uh, for my personal story. So week one last year, I went Tyler Cook, who got injured, however many three, four, whatever many minutes into his first game, and scored a ten over the double, and I didn't have the best year by my standards, but but like came back and was just outside the top five hundred. So even if things go wrong early and you make some poor picks or things don't go your way, you can definitely catch it back up. So. If you, you go someone that doesn't quite pop as your captain, it's not the end of the world. You can definitely fight it back. There's a there's a long way to go. Oh, absolutely. Such a long season. You know, I'm the same as you, Phoenix. Had weeks where I think I captain Mitch Creek the week that he had the double oh, game week, but got but got injured in the first the uh, knee, show, yeah. yeah, the knee in the showdown against United. So 
you know, you're already missing an extra game from your captain. And then I was lucky enough to to captain Trey Carl when he had a triple double and he put up like a, yeah. literally a set a 70 super coach in one game. So, you know, you're gonna hit him, you're gonna miss him. That's the fun of it. You know, you gotta you gotta just go with your gut, go for the guys you like watching. That's what I end up doing anyway, just going for the guys I like watching. Hence why PJC usually becomes my captain every single week because I'm obsessed. <laughs> Oh, if anyone, obviously, if you're not following uh, Boz, make sure you are on Twitter. But uh, yeah, the 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 logo, the icon is uh, is PJC, and <laughs> it's it's pretty justifiable. I, I like him. He's a he's a stud and knows how to play. But he's got that confidence. And in terms of Super Coach, obviously, he's been a fantastic asset. It's just a shame that they again have that early fixture issue. But I'm sure he's someone that we're all going to have in our teams come round five. One hundred percent. I think that's uh, we probably covered most of the stuff. Was there any other any other thoughts or any players or teams or advice you want to give to the people before the season kicks off in a couple of days? Yeah, look, I think in terms of advice on last minute tips, you know, there's so much information out there in terms of articles. There's Twitter. There's teams getting thrown up everywhere. If you're in our Discord, you'll see there's a team advice um, kind of channel where there's just been teams thrown up. At the end of the day, guys, you just got to back yourself. Have a bit of fun with it. You know, it's just a game, as we always say. Don't stress too much as long as you're enjoying your time. So me personally, I have only started watching the NBL for a couple of years, but the okay. joy that Supercoach brings me while well, I've, I've watched NBA since I was like 10. So I'm a big basketball yeah. head, but never really got into the NBL. But the amount of fun I had last year going to games, I've never been to an NBL game, but I went to as many United and Sem games being from Melbourne as I could but not to go and watch them in Melbourne, to go and watch all the other players. I didn't miss a New Zealand game because of PJC because he was in my team. So the fun yeah. you can get from this game is just incredible. So please don't be hard on yourselves. Back yourself, have fun. Be patient with your boosts. I'm sure throughout the year we might touch on some boost strategy when it comes up to periods of time where we think we should use them. Don't use your boost after round one just because one of your premiums does bad. Just back him in, okay? If you have three injuries, sure, you might need to use a boost. But if... There's a guy that you thought was going to be good, plays one bad game, just back him in for a little bit longer. So be patient. Um, and lastly, if you are someone that has watched the NBL before, is familiar, trust the guys you know. That's my advice. That's why I'm happy to start some of these guys like a Froling at the moment because I trust them. I've seen them. I've watched them. They've put up good numbers for me and I'm happy to try um, and reward them again. I know it's very easy. You see the shiny new toy. You see your Kendrick Davis. You see all these new imports and you want to put them all on your team end of the day we haven't really seen what they're like in the regular season so look buyers beware go for it if you like a risk but at the same time lock in those guys that you can trust yeah i i like it that's uh it's a very good point and definitely what you said about enjoying it too like obviously we're all we're all interested in whether we're playing for overall or we're playing in a league with mates or colleagues or whatever or we all want to take the the, the crown from from Dave. It's uh, it, it, there's obviously lots of different reasons for playing, but yeah, exactly what Boz just said. The main one should be to have fun, enjoy it. You're gonna have good weeks. You're gonna have bad weeks. There's gonna be great scores, poor scores, good luck, bad luck, as there is always is with fantasy stuff. But yeah, have having having fun is a very key part about it. So if you if you're stuck on a couple of players and there's someone from your team or someone you like that you enjoy watching, go for them. But yeah, I, I think that probably uh, probably wraps us up. I would say so. Unless Boz, have you got anything uh, anything else to touch on? No, look, just you know, you can find me at SC Boz on Twitter. Um, as again, I frequent the uh, Super Coach Hub Discord. There'll be a lot of kind of information coming out between now and Thursday. So Thursday's where your game start. Make sure your team's locked in before then. Um, you know, please feel free to flick me a message if you're, you're keen on getting some more advice. I'm obviously came seventh last year. Not saying that I'm a genius but you know i have had some success and i do pay close attention to the nbl so please i'm here between now and thursday to you know try to make your lives a bit easier yeah the super coach hub has got a, a lot of uh of experienced talent and uh successful coaches in there obviously if you tuned in last week you've got the winner you got seventh and what was burns 13th 15th wherever it ended up being like you've got yeah. Cra crazy good coaches here so plenty of advice out there so make sure you do jump into the discord uh 
And yeah, make sure you're following everyone over on Twitter on exits where most of us are usually pretty active as well. Uh, I'm at fantasy Phoenix underscore, but I think if you just type in fantasy Phoenix or fantasy Phoenix MBL or whatever, you'll find me there. Uh, just as Boz said, happy to, happy to help out if you've got, uh, you know, toss ups between a couple of players or anything like that. Um, hope you help as uh, much as I can. But uh, yeah, make sure you're joining in the Discord. Uh, if you're enjoying the content or we've helped you out, make sure to like and subscribe. This will be happening throughout the year. So you'll have uh, plenty of advice and uh, some uh, banter coming your way. And again, with those leagues, we'll have um, it, we'll have those codes in the Discord and potentially in the description below. So make sure you're jumping in those. We've got cash prizes, helping out charity as well for a separate league and the illustrious Super Coach Ring, which is, uh, I think would be the best prize of them all there. So if you haven't already, make sure to do all that. And I think that's probably us wrapped up. So thank you very much for watching everyone. Boz, thank you very much for jumping in. As uh, as we were saying, it's good to finally get to chat with people properly that we are, we're talking with online. So it's been uh, it's been very enjoyable, mate. I think we've uh, we've got some good info out there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Always a pleasure, and you know, best of luck, guys. It's three days away, so let's have some fun. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. We'll uh, we'll catch you all next week. Bye.